As Cox and Schofield moved from the coast toward Goldsboro, Sherman entered North Carolina southwest of Fayetteville. Leading the left wing of the Union advance was cavalry under Major General Justin Kilpatrick. Justin Kilpatrick is a man who came from a middle class farming family, and he has big ambitions as a youth to be president of the United States and to write a drama better than anything Shakespeare did. He's a ladies man, legally, because he's a widower. Kilpatrick found he had gotten between the rebel cavalry led by Lieutenant General Wade Hampton and Major General Joseph Wheeler and the Confederate Army Corps under Lieutenant General William Hardy, which had recently evacuated Charleston, South Carolina. When it entered North Carolina, Hardy's Corps was a mere shadow of itself, having lost nearly half of its men due to desertion and the South Carolina governor's refusal to allow reserves and militia from his state to cross the border. Kilpatrick split his cavalry force and was in camp with two of his four brigades when he was surprised by Hampton and Wheeler at Monroe's Crossroads early on the morning of March 10. Kilpatrick, who is riding with a member of his staff, a rather busty female. No man has, has that busty, has that pro prominent chest. He is spending a quiet night when Hampton's men surprise him at Monroe's Crossroads. Kilpatrick thinks fast. He'll come out on the porch at Monroe's Crossroads, the Monroe house, holding his britches in one hand. The Confederates go by and they say, where's Kilpatrick? And Kilpatrick say, he went that way. And that's not the way he went. His embarrassing situation would later be referred to as Kilpatrick's shirt tail skedaddle. The attacking Confederate troopers initially routed the Federal cavalry, which was heavily outnumbered and caught off guard. But the Union cavalry reformed and counterattacked, forcing Confederates to withdraw toward Fayetteville as a large Federal infantry force approached. The Battle of Monroe's Crossroads was one of the last major cavalry engagements of the Civil War. Now what this does though, it allows the rear elements of Hardy's infantry and Hampton's cavalry to successively reach Fayetteville without any further direct contact with Sherman's forces. Now the Confederate stay in Fayetteville will be very, very brief. By the evening of March 10th, Hardy's infantry have crossed Cape Fear and are heading up the Raleigh Fayetteville Plank Road or Stagecoach Road here towards this area here. All left now in Fayetteville is Hampton's cavalry to perform a rear guard. In the morning of 11th, March 11th, Sherman's advanced elements reached Fayetteville, and after a brief street fight with Hampton and his few cavalrymen, and then a contested fight along the Cape Fear at the Clarendon Bridge, Hampton successfully burns the bridge, and all Confederate forces are now on the east side of the Cape Fear, moving in this direction of Aversboro. Now, Sherman will Sherman will pause briefly in Fayetteville. One, he has to unencumber his army of several thousand white and black refugees that, that's attached itself to uh, his army. He will send them down to Wilmington. He also has to destroy the Confederate arsenal there. He's not gonna leave any soldiers behind. And the last thing he wants to do is leave a functioning arsenal there behind his lines like that. So after several days, Sherman's army is on the move. And on March 14th, they will conduct a reconnaissance up along the road here, the Plank Road, towards the direction of Averysboro. 